Okay, <clears throat> so now we have a comment by uh, Victoria Thompson, who is co-director of the Institute for Humanities Research and Associate Professor of History at Arizona State University. Uh, she's published articles in such journals as Urban History Review, History and Memory, Studies and Travel Writing, and the Journal of Urban History. And she has a chapter in the uh, anthology that I mentioned before, Homosexuality in Modern France, edited by Jeff and by uh, Tip Reagan. She's the author of The Virtuous Marketplace, Women and Men, Money and Politics in Paris, 1830 to 1870. Women in 19th Century Europe with co-author Rachel Fuchs. And she's editor of A Cultural History of Work in the Age of Empire. She's currently completing a monograph entitled Inventing Public Space, Paris from 1748 to 1790. Okay, so we've heard three really excellent papers today by three eminent scholars. Um, I'm sure we'll have a great discussion, so I'm going to keep my comments short. Um, I really want to raise just two issues that um, reading the papers together um, made me think about um, that uh, perhaps will be interesting to you, at least I hope. The first is how the insti institutional structure of policing in Paris may have influenced decisions concerning why certain crimes were prosecuted. And the second is the role of ordinary Parisians in policing the city. So in old regime France, of course, not surprisingly, the police was not a single institution. As Alan Williams has noted, a police force as we think of it today didn't actually exist in Paris. Instead, policing functions were spread among various institutions and officials with overlapping and competing jurisdictions. At the head of the Châtelet was the Prévôt de Paris, who was originally seconded by a civil lieutenant and a criminal lieutenant whose competencies overlapped. In 1667, a third lieutenant was created at the Châtelet, the lieutenant of police, who was an administrator and magistrate. For a case to be heard by the lieutenant of police, a procès verbal had to be filed with the commissaire de police and recommended for a hearing by the procureur du roi. All three lieutenants were, of course, officers of the, Châ were officers of the Châtelet, which was itself subordinate to the parliament. The parliament regularly reversed decisions made by the lieutenant of police. Furthermore, the lieutenants of the Châtelet were also officers of the Crown, which was itself represented in Paris by the Keeper of the Seals, four Secretaries of State, and the Controller General. So to be the lieutenant of police, you had to be exceptionally diplomatic, uh, needless to say. <laughs> so um, the first question that, um, that I thought about reading these papers was wondering if this overlapping of officers engaged in a struggle for authority may have influenced in any way why, as both Kate and Jeff tell us, um, offenses such as sodomy, prostitution, and procuring were not routinely punished um, or were punished in the way they were. In other words, how did the politics of overlapping jurisdictions shape how policies concerning these matters were enforced on the ground? Closer to the ground were the 48 commissaires, who were under the authority of all three lieutenants of the Châtelet, these three competing lieutenants, and who had extensive and varied responsibilities. These were men who came from educated middling, from the educated middling classes. They bought their posts, these were venal offices, and they were required to live in their jurisdictions. They supplemented their revenues by performing duties similar to those of notary publics. The commissaires had a financial incentive to remain in their homes and let business come to them rather than to engage in active policing by patrolling the markets, streets, and gardens of Paris. And this brings me to ordinary Parisians. Um, Kate and Jeff's papers demonstrate that those suspected of um, a crime were often brought by Parisians to the commissaire de police. A group of Parisians led the widow Belanger, led by, excuse me, led by the widow Belanger, showed up at the home of Commissaire de Mortin one morning with a woman they had taken into custody. Another group of Parisians brought Nicolas Ambert to the home of Commissaire Reignard. Um, when Louis Mangin was, Manigan, excuse me, was arrested, um, it was after several people complained to an officer of the watch that he made advances to young men did conversation at the wine merchants, um, the wine merchant who was one of those in this group, lead this crowd to organize a party like that of the widow Belanger to set out and have Manigan arrested. 
These examples suggest that maintaining public order was not only about initiating a judicial process against those suspected of committing crimes, it was also about maintaining public order among Parisians who accused others. Policing was, of course, about managing the expectations of one's superiors, a tricky situation, but it was also about another tricky situation, managing the expectations of the Parisian crowd. At times, this called for an extremely public display of justice, as in the case of Moyon. On a more regular basis, however, it seems that the shift toward the use of royal warrants um, rather than the courts to deal with, as Kate puts it, quote, criminals whom authorities wanted to imprison quickly and quietly indicated a growing desire to avoid the sort of public reaction that might lead to disorder. So if Mercier is to be believed, public punishments became more distasteful to some because the crowd approved and enjoyed this sort of spectacles. Um, and, uh, you know, as both Kate and Jeff have, have mentioned in their papers, these records and the punishments tell us something about the judges' attitudes. But I wonder if they also indirectly might some tell us something about the crowd's attitudes. Was, uh, were crimes such as sodomy and prostitution becoming more tolerated, or was opinion more divided about them, and therefore was public punishment less, um, attractive to officials because it might draw the ire of the crowd. Can we even draw such conclusions from the Chatelet records about public attitudes? Policing was uh, th therefore a dance that involved agents on the ground, the commissaires, and the Parisian crowd. Parisians were active in complaining about crimes and criminals and in demanding that justice be served. And as Kate's and Jeff's papers demonstrate, they clearly felt that they had a role to play in efforts to police the city. And this role was recognized by authorities who took their witness statements, initiated investigations <coughs> at their behest, and punished those found guilty. It is possible that this active role of policing became more important in the second half of the 18th century. Um, Cécile Collin has shown that when a commissaire made an appearance in a street in relation to a crime, that the people who lived in that street were more likely to go back to that commissaire in a future matter. Um, at the same time, Vincent Milieu has shown that over the course of the 18th century, the tenure of commissaires in a neighborhood tended to shorten as they sought to move up the ranks by moving to a different neighborhood or as they got burned out by policing in difficult neighborhoods. In certain administrative districts, like that of the Palais Royal, this turnover was quite dramatic, um, diminishing from an average of 8.8 .8 years before 1750 to 3.8 years after 1750. So given that commissaires were not compensated for active policing, that their number did not increase despite the growth in population in the city, and given this turnover, we can surmise that Parisians in the Palais Royal district might have felt an even, even greater responsibility for actively policing their neighborhood. Now, of course, the police were not allowed in the gardens of the Palais Royal before the revolution, as the Abbe Bernard well knew when he denounced the presence there of National Guard troops. So this brings me to the questions about the nature of collective action in the first year of the revolution that Bernard's arrest prompted for Suzanne de Sain. Dassan argues that the actions of the crowd during the October days can be seen as a collective effort on the part of Parisians to pressure and protect revolutionary authorities. In her paper, we see the crowd working out how to navigate a new set of revolutionary institutions to achieve their goals, institutions whose functions and scope were uncertain. One of the institutions in flux was the police, as the venal office of the commissaire had been abolished along with all other venal offices on August 4th. The police would be continually reconfigured during the revolution. If we think about the collective action of the early revolution that Dassan describes um, in the context of the policing authority of the crowd that Norberg's and Merrick's paper suggest, we can ask whether this revolutionary collective action was in part a continuation of earlier efforts by ordinary Parisians to maintain order in their city. In the neighborhood of the Palais Royal, where commissaires did not spend very long in office, the sort of power vacuum that Dassan dis identifies with the decline of royal power had been an issue before the revolution began. Uh, Milio thus quotes Mercier, who was himself a denizen of the Palais Royal, as complaining about the absence of a policing presence in the streets and markets of Paris. 
This tradition of active policing on the part of ordinary Parisians may have contributed to their willingness to work collectively to influence authorities as the revolution began <coughs> and may also help us understand why revolutionary authorities viewed crowd actions as legitimate despite the violent means that they sometimes employed. So would you three like to respond at all or shall we open this up? Yes, we have such a robust audience here. Thank you for uh, an incredibly inspiring panel, um, and I really love the investigative tone of all of your papers. You're all uh, so excited to get to the bottom of this and to work with these documents. Um, but my question uh, is sort of inspired by what Jeff was saying about the plus amplement informé and 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 sort of trying to guess what's behind that. Um, I mean, there's so many silences in these documents, as we all know. I've used them for sedition, now I'm using them for counterfeiting, and I've come across this. Um, we've got drunk witnesses, we've got people who deny things, right? We've got dropped cases. And I was just fascinated by that idea that maybe that plus amplement informé is, is you know, hiding a reluctance to prosecute. Perhaps it's a, a, a real cultural shift here that we can get at. And I wanted to ask each of you to maybe talk a little bit about the role that that sort of artful connecting the dots plays in that investigative historical work in, in police archives, as well as trying to actually sort of get the truth with a capital T and, and figure out what's happening, because there's a lot of gaps in, in those documents. That's my question. Well, I'll, I'll go first. Yes, well, I, I was in partially, that's why I went through the whole trial. And in the longer version, I say probably that these, these kind of cases are extremely hard to um, prosecute successfully for the following reasons. First of all, a child is a very bad witness. You know, I emphasize that the, the demoiselle, she thinks these are ladies. Whereas, an, oh, you know, she's too young to know a lot of social distinctions that might actually help the police. So I think that's always a problem. Secondly, is the idea that anybody would come forward and actually testify, because no one wants to be there at the scene, of because you're immediately implicated. So that means you've got almost no witnesses. And the same thing is true of, of any kind of sodomitical activity. You don't want to be on the scene. So that kills off any potential witnesses. They usually use the policeman, is my are often brought forward because they seem to be know something about it. So I think that's it's just very very hard to actually get a conviction. And then they have this very narrow definition of rape, which uh, also uh, precludes and some confusion around how to deal with with uh, children at all. So I think it's just it's not a winner for them. Although in the 1750s, I read the chit chat between the the, shot, the policeman and the chatelet, and the policeman keeps saying, "Oh, the magistrate," by which I think they mean collectively the procureur du roi and um, the uh, lieutenant criminel are, are, are really eager to press this forward. They're really eager to press this forward. Whereas the police are sort of holding back because they often get surprised by things. And, and so I think it's just a legal problem. And after a while, here they have the ordre du roi. No problem there. You can, you know, dispatch people overnight after you get the order without any uh, problems at all. So, and also I think there is this Dia this um, constant conflict for them between secrecy, putting a veil on it, right? And this is part of the attraction of the Ultra du Roi because there are actually, I have one sodomite whom I, but they now call them, um, uh, not sodomites, but um, uh, I can't think of, I'll think of it in a minute. I had it written down, but it's not here on these papers. Uh, um, <coughs> Pederus, yes, that's it exactly. Uh, who is the son of a négociant? He breaks every single rule. He's the son of a négociant who himself uh, sleeps with valets, right, and brings them up to his father's house and then procures them for rich princes. Now this guy, they want out of completely taken out of Paris in a closed, you know, in a closed carriage because he's broken every single rule that they have. And they can just dispatch him with an ordre du roi. And it's often used, I think, for, I, I don't think I'm wrong in this, for a, a higher class people, for that reason. This is a, a huge, uh, but really important uh, issue. Uh, Richard Anders, in his uh, book on the, on the Parliament, says that the further inquiry is actually 
the most common verdict. You know, it's more common than any other verdict. So more often than not, what these magistrates are deciding is, or what they're not deciding, what they're saying is, um, we're going to just let this hang for a while, and if further evidence comes forward, maybe we'll do something. But more often than not, there is no further evidence. So even though further inquiry is technically, uh, legally speaking, it's, it's defamatory. There, there are some consequences that go along with it. Um, uh, in effect, what these, these cases all end up being, in effect, dismissed or at least uh, let go. So this is not just about sodomy, it's about many other types of offenses as well. So it's a, it's a much larger phenomenon about how the magistrates are, I think, distancing themselves from the, the, the draconian sentences that are inscribed in statute. Mm -hmm. And this happens way before the Enlightenment could have anything to do with it. This, this trend is there by 1700 already. Uh, what on earth is going on? Um, I mean, the one parallel I can think of to evoke is what happens to witchcraft persecution in the, in the 17th century, right? I mean, we know from uh, Alfred Soman's work that as early as the 1630s, the parliament is overturning convictions at the local level. And then there's the royal statute in the 1680s, which the king declares there's no such crime as witchcraft anymore. Well, the magistrates seem de facto to be saying these things may be crimes in law, but we're not going to treat them as crimes uh, anymore. So I, I don't know if anyone has done this. Um, you know, I'm retired, and I don't have access to a big library or anything anymore, so maybe someone here knows. But it certainly seems like this further inquiry sentence is something that someone should study. I don't know how you would go about sampling it, given the, the huge corpus of material, but uh, something might come up if you did some sort of sondage over time and comparison among different types of offenses. Um, I think that your question and this question are, are also connected, too, because uh, we tend to think that the magistrates, you know, sat in closed chambers and made decisions, but they knew what the talk was in the street, especially if a case emanated from the street in terms of, of popular complaint. And it uh, strikes me that the cases that I've got here, the five that I've got, uh, none of these cases came from the Tuileries or the Luxembourg or the Palais Royal, which are the places where men traditionally went to find men. They all happened in the streets, in neighborhoods, mm. where, you know, the, the Luxembourg and the Palais Royal and the Tuileries, they're all patrolled by some sort of police forces. And there's the watch out on the streets, but the boulevards, in the boulevards, the people, the neighbors, do have more of an ongoing responsibility of doing the policing themselves. So. It's a great question to which I don't have a good answer. Uh, at, the, uh, at the moment that I'm looking at, um, I don't have a huge sample the way my colleagues do, but I, um, I noticed really different treatment according to what the individuals were doing. There are a number of, you know, the son of the horse seller and his buddy, the apprentice, whatever, who get off quite easily. Uh, then the other thing I noticed is there's so, so, uh, sometimes sentences which then are swiftly overturned. And I, I actually think what's going on, it's less actually about the sentencing of these individuals and, you know, having them stand up there with this badge of shame on them, than um, uh, the actual act of policing in the Palais Royale to try to show that they're sweeping up individuals and, and, and try to keep things reasonable through that rather than necessarily through the sentences that they're meeting out. That's my sense. That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, for Suzanne, just There's a mic. For Suzanne, just a quick uh, clarification um, for your really terrific paper. Uh, you've talked about this th thin line between violent and peaceful demonstrations or projected demonstrations. What do we know about the arming or the uh, availability of arms of these folks in the Palais Royal as opposed to the National Guard who are wandering through? Do they have well, <laughs> swords or sabers or, or even uh, mus muskets? What do yeah. we know? Well, okay. I w I I was just talking yesterday with Mike about this problem. I'm trying to figure out what the, I think the reason they want to get the 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 um, the reason why Benach, for example, wants to go to the districts and gets the guard to go with them is because they know that they will have arms. And you know, I have my guy who dressed up in order to try to get arms. And and tr I'm actually trying to chart among different accounts whether they say this group of 1,500 
men are armed or not, whether they mention it or not, because there seems to be different opinions <coughs> according to different newspaper accounts and witness accounts. Uh, so I'm actually, I, I, I can't actually answer the question of how armed they are. Um, but it's clear that they're trying to get arms or trying to get people to go with them who have arms. So, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> the, one, the one who laments, uh, I would, here's what I would do. If, if I, I had, had a gun. gun. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, Let's move to Texas. <laughs> Other questions? Wait a second. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Kathleen. In Wisconsin, we have concealed carry, so. <laughs> Let's move to Wisconsin. We don't have gun culture that way. Any other questions? Yes. Um, didn't they, I, I just before moving on, didn't they distribute 60,000 arms in August 1789? Yeah, isn't, isn't that part of, of what happened in the aftermath of, of... I thought they collected arms after the storming of the Bastille. And then gave them back out again, I thought. To whom? To uh, the proto-National Guardsmen in the aftermath of the night of, of 4 August. Okay, but that's guardsmen you're saying. But I, th I don't. I think I that think they, they go farther than that. Th I think okay, that they well, go for the, okay. farther than that. Cool. So just we'll talk about. Thank you. Um, but it, the other, th the the more general question, it seemed to me, is also the question of how does the parcelization of Paris fit into the story? You know, Victoria brought up, I thought, really usefully, kind of thinking about the overlapping jurisdictions. But part of those overlapping jurisdictions is on the ground. You know, the privileged enclaves um, are, of course, one part of that. Since some of the, what policing there is of the privileged enclaves ends up in the Châtelet part of the time, I also wonder whether the fact that the privileged enclaves are usually run by the church might have some impact on this emphasis on family that Jeff brought up I thought in a really interesting manner. And it seems like part of what we might want to be thinking about is not just the overlapping jurisdictions, but the overlapping jurisdictions among the church and, and the monarchy. That it's, it's overlapping in a bunch of different ways. And that that might complicate why certain things get done in certain places and why they don't. And if anybody has anything that they'd like to add about that, that's great. If not, you know, I'll just move on. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> Put on my Swiss Guard uniform. Put the jacket on. Yeah. Now I can speak ex cathedra. Uh, <laughs> so you're right. There are all kinds of uh, enclaves, and in, in terms of uh, for same-sex relations, if you if you think about ecclesiastical institutions, it means monasteries and the, and the college. And there are hundreds and hundreds of cases that involve uh, monks or teachers in the college or as objects of desire uh, students. But uh, as, far, well, as far as I know, with one or two exceptions that I can think of so far, none of those cases go the ecclesiastical route. They don't go to the officialité. Right, they come out of the uh, ecclesiastical enclaves, and, and as you say, they end up in in the Châtelet. And the Tom, to, when they catch somebody at the Tom, to, they bring them to the Châtelet. Right, and so I'm, and again, it's the origins of those that I was wondering whether that might help shape uh, what they're what they're focusing on in their in their premises of what they're defending. Okay, uh, for the ecclesiastical cases, um, the church defends its own. There uh, seems to be a history of that. Um, so you have uh, lots of the cases involving priests and monks. Um, Cardinal Fleury writes a letter to the Lieutenant General of Police, or the uh, uh, abbot of the monastery, or the, uh, you know, the rector of, of the college, and they do everything they can to hush up the cases involving ecclesiastics. Uh, I, I can think of one priest who did some time in prison, and maybe two or three who were banished from the capital. Uh, but the rest, they all get covered up. And there's documentation in the dossiers. This is the best thing to do for the defense of religion and the glory of God. There's lots of people caught, I would guess, in the Tantra, in, in you know, the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, in um, the precincts of, 
of the other FA, you know, which are remember open and commercial, that I'm, I'm, I, I was actually thinking of the secular cases rather than the priestly uh -huh. cases. Yeah, I've never seen a case that originates in the Tom or involves anyone who was doing time in the Tom. But one that I'm interested in, really interested in right now is in the, the Palais Royale. One of the many projects I'm, I'm juggling is to read through the cartons of documents from the commissaire for the Cartier of the Palais Royal um, every 10 years and then the entire 1780s when the renovations take place and it becomes the center of depravity and corruption in the capital and so on and so forth. Uh, I have found a number of cases in which the guards of the Palais Royal, employees of the Orléans family, and I can't find anything about this in the Orléans family papers in our sheet, but cases in which the guards um, they can't arrest, but they detain men inside the Palais Royal and then take them outside to where the municipal police, uh, one, one or another form of police, is, is waiting to arrest them. So there's, there's a clear example of collaboration among uh, authorities. Maybe that's the, more the sort of thing you're thinking about. Um, I, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, there are in the, the uh, particular justice that I found most useful after the Châtelet is Montmartre, which most people don't look up, but it was an extremely rowdy neighborhood. And so, yes, indeed, they do arrest prostitutes. And there was even one case of, of this kind of abduction and seduction. But I didn't include it because our panel was on the Châtelet. So. But there, I think, yeah, they have a very different, the fact that it is, it's ecclesiastical, but of course it's run by secular lawyers and everything goes on. And there are full, uh, wonderful full cases of breaking up brothels when that is stopped pretty much in Paris because they tend to, later on in the 18th century, they tend to prosecute outdoor prostitution uh, much more severely than indoor, all right? Uh, so, but in, in Montmartre, they're still doing that. And it's, I don't, people usually don't talk about it, but it's really uh, such an incredibly rowdy area. They have a capital case at least every month. Somebody's killed in the cabaret. Um, uh, an incredibly wonderful source is kind of overlooked. Nina, you there? Did you have a question? Yeah. Well, you had your hand up. I know, no, I'm not sure it's a question. I'm trying to make it a question. It's, I'm not sure it's a question. I have a thought. Um, it's about the Palais Royal, and, and I think, Victoria, you might have thoughts about this, too, because of public space. I mean, it, it seems like self-evident, you know, it's a space of libertinage, it's a space, then it becomes a space of political sedition. But why is that? I mean, yes, liberty is a kind of common thread. Criminality is a kind of common thread. The notion of libertine, of, of libertine ideas and libertine actions, there's a, you know, a, a veil, a multivalency there. But it, maybe it's not self-evident. And so why is it? How is it that a space before the revolution of libertinage becomes the central space of political sedition in the revolution and, and and is there any discomfort with that? Are there problems with the space that's associated with sexual liber libertinage becoming a central space of political sedition in 1789? So I think uh, the fact that before the August 4th abolition of feudalism the fact that the Palais Royal was a place that was supposed to be free of policing obviously made it a spot that was uh, open for dis more open for discussion of politics. And there are uh, uh, there are multiple factors. I mean, Philippe d'Orléans, I almost called him Philippe Egalité, but it's too soon. <laughs> um, you know, he, he has, uh, this is a question that's up for debate, but he's somewhat encouraged discussion of poly. He's obviously critical of uh, the monarchy and part of the pre-revolutionary opposition. And then the other thing is that it is actually to the Palais Royal that um, when the revolutionary crowd liberates the French guard on uh, who have been arrested, this is before the storming of the Bastille, I think it's June 30th, when they liberate them um, from what they consider to be too harsh punishment and imprisonment for having been um, rebelling against the officers and, and 
not keeping the peace the way the officers want them to. The place they take them to celebrate is the Palais Royale, so they're trying to keep them safe. So I think there are sets of practices, and then of course, Camille de Milan, the, uh, you know, the speeches. Uh, uh, it, 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 so the Palais Royale becomes, because it is free from policing and because a pattern develops, which actually Micah talks about this in his book, a pattern develops early, early in the revolution that that becomes a place for radicals to gather and then it, it gains momentum that way and continues it even when it's no longer free, free from policing. Okay, we have to wrap this up. Thank you so much for this wonderful attendance.